Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Marceau. I'm the group head of payment at Kindred Group. And uh, today I'm not going to uh, talk about, uh, uh, about payment solution, but I am so, so happy to moderate this breakout session with uh, my Kindred Dream Team here. Uh, who uh, everyone will soon introduce themselves. So it's it's morning here, uh, as it's a pre-recording uh, pre-recording session, uh, but it's 12:45 in Central uh, Central Europe. And although it's pre-recorded, uh, we are still here and we'll be able to answer your message. Uh, so don't hesitate to uh, to ask uh, a question uh, and uh, please fire away, and uh, one of us will uh, will answer your question. So we shall we shall start with uh, this round table, and we shall start with uh, with, with Mete here. Hi, Mete. Good afternoon. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Mete Lorenzen, and I'm the global head of our customer service department at Kindred, uh, which is is quite a big team. Uh, I think you know we have around 300 employees. I'm personally based in Malta, but our team is is based across locations. Um, and yeah, I think that's me. Over to Usha. Good morning. Uh, my name is Usha Gennison. I am the group head of financial control. Uh, I am based in London in our Wimbledon office. Um, and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, manage um, the local teams, the local finance team uh, teams in their um, in their day-to-day -day activities with regards to month close and statutory accounts. And uh, off to Olga. Thanks, Isha. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Olga Hupanen. I lead on leadership development in Kindred. So it means helping the business both in recognizing what leadership is and what leadership capabilities are relevant for us as an organization, and also building those capabilities up both through the program um, that we've designed, but also through one-to-one -one coaching. Uh, I'm based in London. Um, that's me. Um, and over to Charlotte. Hi, uh, Charlotte is my name, uh, and I'm head of player verification. I uh, work very much with product related uh, verification and verification providers. Yeah, I've been at Kindred for a couple of two years now, uh, <laughs> not as long as uh, everyone else here on this call, I think, but uh, still going strong. Um, yeah, really happy. Very to good. Here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, probably. Uh, the audience is realizing why uh, I mentioned the dream team, you know, looking at uh, you and looking at what you're doing. Uh, I think uh, I couldn't have hoped for, for a, better, a better panel today. So Woman in Tech this year is, is around the, the power of resilience, which is um, extremely relevant to, uh, I think, what we went through over the past few months. Uh, and we discussed uh, before this, this panel and over the past few months, uh, with Olga here uh, around uh, around the power of resilience and you know psychologists define resilience as uh, looking at at positive outcome uh, despite uh, um, the high high risk status. Uh, they describe it as competence in the face of stress, adapting to trauma, using challenges for growth in order to make future hardship more manageable. And I believe this is definitely uh, uh, super relevant. Uh, but but my first question is, uh, what does that mean? Uh, for you being resilient, you know, past few days, past few weeks, past few months, uh, and maybe we should start with, with Mete again here. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for me, being resilient really means, like, very simple, that uh, the glass is always half full, as I see the world. Uh, so that's that's what I apply in, in my private life, daily life, and, and at work. Uh, and I think, yeah, <laughs> the, the last the last months, weeks, um, that could be anything like, you know, I'm a big foodie and I love food, but if restaurants close, how, how do I manage that? And, you know, I learned to make beef wellington quite to perfection during that time. Um, but yeah, okay. then... Are, are you are you planning any uh, beef wellington this week? Uh, because I, I'm a big fan of beef wellington, so... <laughs> I've made too many, so uh, now probably <laughs> okay. change to vegetarian. <laughs> okay, Usha? Um, yes, uh, for me, uh, resilience is uh, accepting the situation, um, 
I think the last days, months, and the last year, if I can say, has been quite challenging. Uh, being a mother of two um, during the lockdown, and like everybody else, it's been quite challenging to manage family and work. Um, it's embracing the change. It's having a positive outlook on what needs to be done uh, in order to be successful, and it's not giving up. Nice. Olga? For me, resilience is more about balance, recognizing that we are all going through such tough period of time. So um, being really busy at work, um, doing loads of other things, it's recognizing when the pressure is really high and taking time off um, and you can't plan it. It's more about practicing self-compassion uh, and noticing whatever is happening within you. Which is, you know, when, uh, when we spoke about resilience over the past few months, um uh, during during the course that you uh, that you handled one of the thing about resilience was also the you know the contact with other uh, mm, but which is absolutely. something kind of that we we lost uh, i mean obviously we have our family or, or you know partner etc so that that's one thing but it's uh when i watched again the video that you had shared it, it, it's quite challenging right definitely it is about finding ways to maintain that social interaction that we are all lacking at the moment um, and technology helps a lot, um, but finding time um, also in connecting to people and being more proactive has, has been really important personally for me. I've spent a lot of time on Zoom on both professionally and personally um, over the last year, it feels. Me too. And funnily enough, I reconnected with some people uh, that I lost, I lost connection with, you know, before the, the whole period. So, uh, so anyway, very, very late. Uh, uh, you know, late Zoom parties, uh, I would say. But uh, Carlotta, what does that mean for you? Zoom parties. Well, that's uh, work, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, happens every day. Um, no, um, resilience for me, it kind of means, I would say it means a lot in the world of uh, product development because it's, it's all about iterating uh, in my in my head and um, always finding a way forward uh, you know whenever uh, whenever someone closes the door there there's a window open right yeah okay great uh, i mean one of one of the points that uh, that you you mentioned was uh, uh, was this social interaction and uh, and i think it's a very good transition to uh, our first topic around you know engagement with our with our employee we, are, we have met here uh, handling uh, approximately 20% of our workforce. So how, uh, Mete, over the past few, few months, uh, did you manage to, to shift from uh, office engagement, you know, uh, to, to an online engagement? Yeah, I think, uh, obviously, a lot of the things that, that were just said here in the intro uh, has kind of been the fundamental to, to achieve that. Um, and, and although I, I, I started off saying, you know, glass is half full and, you know, then I just make beef wellington instead of going to a restaurant. Uh, obviously, I have also found this period, uh, like, you know, the last year has been super challenging uh, with, with the global situation and the pandemic. And for a big team like, like ours, you know, customer service, um, yeah, that was quite challenging because not only, I mean, to drive engagement, uh, for yourself, that's one thing, but be able to translate that and, and embed that in, in a big department of 300 people through many layers. Uh, usually in the office environment, you know, you can you can interact with people and, and, and that usually comes easier. But yeah, I think first, you know, it, it's, we have actually already prepared ourselves uh, for any unpredictable situation to happen and how we could drive engagement without knowing it. And in a, in a department like customer service that comes almost natural because you know we have a plan we have a strategy like like every other areas of the business but at the same time we also need to be per perfectionists and experts in firefighting because you know we are we are live we are the ones interacting with the customer so there's always something that we might not have predicted or see coming um and how do we prepare ourselves for that but but yeah to kind of Go back to to the initial question like how did we keep our our people engaged um well it, it really came down to you know like first logistically make it happen like that we have the tools the setup uh, which like i said we actually had prepared for that had laptops already you know uh, we had changed the uh, the systems and the tools to cloud based so you know we never knew that we had to apply it in a pandemic situation for an example 
but that turned out to be quite handy. And yeah. then it was just, yeah, to um, to start fixing all, like adapt all the fundamentals that, that we know usually drive engagement. How do we translate that online? And that might mean, you know, like say uh, we had career path uh, progression kind of development programs quickly. That was the first priority. Let's translate that to have online courses instead of meeting in the classroom. Like, so all those basics that usually is quite key that we knew was, was the first priority. Uh, something like recruitment was also like, because if suddenly a, a team is understaffed and, and under pressure, that it will be hard to drive engagement. So you need to fix that fundamentals. And then on, on top of that, we just, um, yeah, now we, we live on teams and we have camera on every meeting. Team outings have, you know, where you used to go to a restaurant, <laughs> you might have a cooking class and make beef Wellington together with a camera. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think don't that's... don't don't tempt me too much on that beef Wellington, you know. Now I, uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, one thing that you said which is extremely relevant is this uh, this uh, this camera thing. I, I realized that now there is not one meeting, you know, without you know the camera on, etc. While before it was you know conference, it was it was about call, you know. But now it's about video call, and I think that's uh, uh, I think that's super. I think it's super positive. Uh, super positive. No, exactly. And, and, and thank you. Just, sorry, sorry but one more thing. I think you know, in, especially in, in our team, uh, we also have a lot of movements. Uh, you know, internal um, uh, internal attrition and etc. So we need to recruit a lot. But for example, last year when the pandemic hit, nobody could travel and you know for interviews or or even move country for to take a new position. Um, but yeah, so so like by replacing with video calls etc we have hired some of the the best talent we probably ever have um yeah just changing the approach but yeah well changing the approach i think that's something that uh, that usha and her team uh, uh, had to you know i mean being responsible or working with financial planning and, and forecasting uh, a year ago uh, it was a massive U-turn into uh, any type of, of businesses, you know, and uh, we had to shift focus, uh, I'm in forecast, uh, change the reality uh, without noting, knowing what the, the future would be. So uh, one question for, for Usha is, you know, how, how did we do that? Yes, so thank you. So you, you, you did um, mention the shift in the focus and, and I think that's key in the ways that um, we uh, had to work uh, in 2020. Obviously, it was a very challenging year for Kindred. Um, but nonetheless, with all the uncertainties that we lived through, it, it ended up um, as being a very successful year for Kindred. If we backtrack to um, March 2020, almost a year ago, when live sport was cancelled un until further notice, um, we all entered into a grey zone and there was a big, big question mark around what the future was going to bring. None of us had a magic crystal ball um, that allowed us to look into the future. Uh, but we knew at, uh, at a point in time that the gambling industry was just one of the global business markets that could um, be uh, severely affected by the crisis. And so we had to react quickly uh, in order to be ahead of the game. So what did we do from a finance perspective uh, within the finance function to focus on these uh, during these uncer uncertain times? So five things um, that I'd like to mention. First of all, we brought the troops together. Really, really important to drive change, to have everybody working as a team. So we brought the troops together from within all the areas of the business and we identified the, risk, uh, the risks that the crisis was presenting to us. So getting input and consensus from various stakeholders was key um, in order to make the right decisions that allowed us for a larger margin of error um, and obviously the greatest chance of success. Secondly, we reduced our cycle time. Uh, we moved uh, to weekly forecasting in order to, to, um, uh, to, to, to take the input from, from what was happening in, um, externally and making sure that we had the latest forecast. Um, we performed scenario modeling to make sure that we, we recovered from all ends. Um, this refers to forecasting several, several um, possibilities or eventual, po eventual possibilities, um, depending on the changes uh, to the variables. Um, as an example, we had different scenarios modeled depending on the duration of the lockdown and the possibility of future lockdown. 
we ran and we reran our models and analyzed the consequences of the restrictions on live sport, which was our main concern. Um, we managed outgoings closely and we avoided making long-term commitments. Um, and lastly, we established a very strong open communication with our suppliers. Um, and we were uh, thankfully able to defer some expenditures in some areas while still remaining with, within our terms and conditions with those suppliers. So all these ways of working, um, starting really from getting the troops together and communicating on an almost daily basis um, was key to success. So 2020 was a memorable year. And regardless of the uncertainty that we experienced on a daily basis, our new ways of working, the resilience of our people, and the team effort we saw were all key contributors to our success. That's uh, that's very uh, very good uh, answer, Usha. Thank you, so, thank you so much. I mean, it's uh, from what I'm hearing. Also, there is a there are quite a lot of things that you know. Even after, if everything goes back to, to normal, there, there are quite a few things that we will keep doing. You know, I mean, the mm -hmm. the video, for instance, uh, conference and interview. You know, so this should not be a blocker for for hiring talent, as Mete was saying. You mentioned a couple of stuff around you know weekly forecasting. Uh, us being agile, I think us being agile, obviously in the in the, in the forecasting and planning, that's something we'll keep. It's uh, it's interesting. I think we, we will all learn from uh, from that uh, situation. So yeah, I like that. Um, very cool. So moving to uh, Olga in a different uh, uh, part of the business. I mean, uh, uh, we we had this uh, amazing program over the past uh, uh, 12 months around uh, around the uh, intra intern cognitive skills which was called a leadership program at kindred and uh, and obviously things that to uh, uh, be shifted around and and olga is a is a is a very famous designer uh, of that program uh, internally so maybe we should start with uh, with uh, the online approach that was uh, chosen for that program and maybe you should uh, you should tell us more about that olga please of course so the focus of the program was to deliver the content and interaction in a more kind of bite-sized uh, or snackable version, thinking about time-hungry um, leaders that, that we have. Um, so actually using online approach uh, worked quite well. Um, the core program was meant to be delivered face-to-face, -face, but then um, having obviously not um, had the opportunity to bring people together, uh, we've just broken it down to smaller chunks uh, and delivered everything virtually. Okay, and uh, I mean that's maybe more a question for the people that attended the program. So we have uh, we have Mete and Usha here. How did you feel uh, about this uh, the, the online program and uh, and how it was designed? Well, for, for my end, uh, I, I think it was it was great and actually almost. <laughs> perfect timing you know uh, yeah in the beginning the expectations were that we would meet and it was in nice fancy locations um, but you know then suddenly we were hit with this unexpected scenario and situation so actually to then have this leadership program also in that setting you, you kind of learned uh, as part of that uh, so for me it was it was brilliant and and actually perfect timing and you realize that I mean you can have human interaction like uh, through the screen as well um, so I think probably I, I completely agree with uh, Mete. I mean, it was a fantastic opportunity that was presented. Um, and um, I, I think nobody knew that it's something we could have done online and, and build that, that rapport and that relationship with the other leaders within the organization. But for me, it was a, a great networking internally opportunity um, and getting to know others um, and also getting this comfort that our others are going through the same challenges as us. But through a screen, it's quite amazing that, you know, um, we still remain in touch on a weekly basis with some of these people that we um, did the leadership program because we're all helping each other. So, yeah, well done to, to, uh, to Olga for, for making this happen uh, and successful. But I think one of the things that uh, that you mentioned also is this social interaction uh, that we uh, that we or social networking that we managed to uh, uh, to keep or to create also to a certain extent and part I know that part of the program uh, was very much uh, around the, the peer coaching and we loved it I mean uh, we loved it to a smaller group etc and and a question to Olga so why uh, we loved it 
but w w why did we love it, do you think? Mm. So the approach, the, the whole methodology for the program was very different from the traditional leadership development programs. Um, I've used adult development framework overall um, and vertical development. So the kind of one of the key contributing factors is to um, create those um, almost like learning ecosystems um, of peer to peer learning and uh, peer coaching groups um, have just addressed that challenge, bringing human connections, um, supporting each other as a collective, as a small community, um, building social network, professional collaboration, and just supporting, being uh, there for each other quite regularly as well. So I think probably that was the element that, that resonated with most people. They were not facilitated as such, so just bringing them, uh, you know, bringing each individual, um, supporting um, kind of each challenge that was brought into the session, uh, rather than having a structured, facilitated content, um, I think was also making the difference. Definitely. I mean, I, I heard, the, the, I heard the, the term, you know, the adjective, you know, amazing, great program was, was fun, uh, interacting. So what, uh, how, did we, how did you measure success, Olga? Um, so there's definitely a number of elements to measurement of success. So there are short term and longer term impacts, right? With shorter term impacts, uh, where we're looking at assessing kind of self evaluation uh, of individual leaders who were going through the program. So looking into uh, their um, reflection on their resilience, uh, connections that they've built throughout the course, uh, but also looking into the impact for their wider teams. Um, so retention of um, their team members, career development of their individual team members, and also we're looking at the overall engagement scores um, that are measured with um, great places to work. Super, thank you uh, so much, Olga, for, for the detail and, uh, and thank you for delivering also that uh, uh, very useful uh, uh, training. Thank you. Uh, Moving on to moving on to to Carlotta, I mean, we you know we, we need to speak about uh, what's uh, what's very important also at Kindred, which is uh, you know customer experience and uh, and player verification as part of the the, the online gambling industry. This is definitely key, and, and often uh, there is an amalgam between player verification and, and friction point. Uh, I must say that. Uh, I always believe that we can enhance customer experience, uh, but also uh, verif verifying our player. Uh, but that's me as, as a global head of payment, you know. And I think, Carlotta, uh, I would like to, to pick obviously your brain and then for you to expand a bit more uh, on the fact that it doesn't have to be a function point. I mean, am I correct or am I wrong? No, you're, you're definitely correct. And I mean, uh, we do work a lot with payments uh, to make sure that we get correct data as well. Um, but yeah, I would say that there's two ways of seeing it. Um, when the customer, when we face the customer with the question of, hey, would you like to send in uh, your ID or provide documents that might be a bit sensitive to the customers? There's two different ways of seeing it. So either we can see it as we're creating a hurdle and we would like to remove it. So we don't want to ask them questions that we think might be too sensitive. But then there's also another way of seeing it, actually about building trust uh, within our customers for them to trust us. And I would say a part of that is having, you know, these great verification solutions. So you can use Bank ID. Uh, I mean, you can use It's Me in Belgium. Uh, we have various EIDs throughout uh, and also having a good system where you can securely upload your documents because you don't want to give your password passport to anyone. You want to make sure that it's actually it's a trusted source. You know, it's secure and encrypted. Um, so I think that's that's kind of also building trust in our brand and making sure that the customer understands that we're kind of like a bank when it comes to regulations and the restrictions that we need to adhere to. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, and, and 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 the good the good thing, and I think we shifted uh, a couple of years ago towards that uh, uh, that mentality is that we do not ask uh, for all those documents uh, when the customer needs to uh, to withdraw his funds, etc. We try to be as, as proactive as we can 
on registration, as you mentioned, with, uh, for instance, Bank ID in Sweden or Name ID in Denmark or, or, or some, some other e verification process. But tr we try to, to smoothen you know, the verification journey. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's definitely correct. Um, and we do have, we have a lot of measurements in place. We have our own customer experience department at Kindred. So we do measure everything that we do. Uh, also working really closely with Meta and the customer support agents to make sure that we get their feedback whenever we release something. Was it good? Is it working? Are we phrasing ourselves in the correct way? or? Did we do something stupid and now Meta gets a lot of work to do? Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of about, you know, making sure that we always listen to our customers and that we iterate our product uh, towards that, towards what they want and what they find um, what works well. And if I can just jump in on, on that, um, because now we, and you're spot on, uh, Charlotte, like, like trust is, is key for us to build with our customers. And, and kind of what, what I alluded to in, in the beginning around, like, why is it so important to drive engagement with, with our team, for example, with our customer facing? is because we see it a bit before we can build that trust uh, and support that uh, to the customers. We need to do the same with our employees. And mm -hmm. so, for example, when the pandemic hit, um, like our priority was to, we want people to work from home uh, so employees are safe and safety comes first. We didn't want to compromise the customer experience, but actually how we then manage that, because in the beginning, you know, logistics, we didn't have enough screens and we didn't have laptop chargers, like basics, but basically that would maybe mean customers would need to wait longer before we can serve them. So we actually were super transparent and uh, we put on, on our help center to the customer you know, uh, we also in the pandemic, you know, from, from person to person, uh, bear with us that we might respond later, but we, we still, you know, want to do exactly the same like we've always done. But but that links directly to what, what Charlotte just talked about, that to build that trust, because one thing is what we do for the customers in the background, but that needs to go all the way and basically bring our values to life um, at Kindred. I think that's... I'm, a, really I'm into that, yeah. It's a really good point. I mean, that, that also brings on to a lot of what we're doing in player sustainability vertical as a whole. I mean, we really care about our customers and we build systems to basically be able to monitor and help our customers to, you know, make sure that basically kind of like this friendly bartender, you know, making sure that you don't have that drink that's maybe, you know, the last drink. You should never have the last drink, right? <laughs> So making sure that if something is happening, we're actually there, we're actually supporting our customers and we're actually helping them make the best decisions for themselves. That's so good, you know, that's so, so good. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, and, and as I said, uh, I think yesterday when we chatted about, you know, the, how, how the session will be, uh, I told you we only did one tech and for the audience here, that are listening to us, you know, it could, it, it is a pre-recording session, but it's one take. We didn't just say, oh, let's do it again. Oh, let's do it again. So that's what, that's how we roll at Kindred also. And I'm so, so, so proud that uh, you all gave uh, me the opportunity to moderate uh, the session today. So thank you, Carlota, Mete, uh, Usha and Olga uh, for your time. I just want to mention something that if you want to chat with us, uh, you can uh, you can visit our stand in the mess hall at uh, 215 CET. Uh, there will be meet and greet with our HR and talent acquisition team. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely day, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.